Welcome. This is the Curriculum Committee meeting. It is April 28th, 2021. We will be recording uh, two presentations uh, that will be uh, presented at this meeting. The first presentation will be in the areas of science and math, led by our Director of Math and Science, Adam Panzer, um, who also has some staff members who will help facilitate the conversation. At this point, uh, Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you and or your designee you have um, uh, identified to start. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible because I have quite a few people here with me who are very eager to share out on all of the work they've been doing this year, which is really fantastic. And I, and I think their firsthand accounts are much more important than what I have to say. Uh, but I will give you a, um, a brief update on where we stand uh, on math and science curricula and the implementation of our incoming standards. So I'm going to present now. Let's hope this goes smoothly. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my presentation? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay, we're good. Okay. So uh, quickly, just to go over the newest iterations of the implementation timelines in math and science, uh, New York State did push things back another year to compensate for COVID. So where we are looking at right now is that on the math end of things, next spring will be the last administration of the current three through eight assessments, whereas spring of 2023 will be the first administration of the New York State grades three through eight assessments that are based on what we call the next generation math learning standards. Then every year um, sequentially after that, we'll see the administration of another new exam. So algebra one, is slated for June 2024 with geometry slated for June 2025. And something to note is that there's going to be some overlap on the math regents exams uh, at the high school level. So whereas June 2025 is the first administration of the new geometry exam, it is the last administration of the algebra one regents exam. June 2026, we will see the first administration of the algebra two regents exam, whereas that will be the last year's administration of the geometry regents exam. And then finally, this all gets wrapped up on the math end as of June 2027 with the last administration of the Common Core Algebra II Regents exam. Uh, so the next big area of focus is spring 2023 when we're going to switch gears in grades three through eight with those new assessments. On the science end of things, we have a similar paradigm. Um, spring 2022 will be the last administration of the grade four assessment that are aligned to the 1996 standards. Think about that. The current standards we are using in science were drafted in 1996. Uh, so we've been long overdue and we are excited about the new New York State science learning standards. Um, interesting to note is since the fourth grade assessment is, is shifting up to grade five, Spring of 2022 will be that last year's, uh, the last year that assessment will be given. There will be no assessment in spring of 2023 because that year's fourth grade will be assessed um, in grade five in the spring of 2024, which is when we will see the first administration of the new grade five and grade eight assessments. Then after that, uh, June 2025 is when we will see the first administration of the biology and earth and space regents exams. And then June 2026 is when we will see the first uh, administration of the chemistry and physics regents exams. Interesting to note is on the science end of things, we do not have that same overlap that we do with the math assessment. So with the math regents exams, we, you know, we, we have uh, two years to play with the new exam while we can still offer the original exam. We do not have that luxury in science. When we flip over, we flip over. So with that said, um, the common theme with the new standards, which you call the Next Generation Mathematics Standards and the New York State Science Learning Standards, um, is that they are heavily focused on practice instead of content. This is very exciting. Up until now, uh, we've been um, kind of, I, I should say, um, we, we've adhered to an approach where the content is at the forefront and then we try to sneak in the skills and practices um, behind that. We're seeing a shift in that paradigm now where the focus is going to be the practice and the content will be secondary to that. So specific to the next generation math standards, I'm not going to, in, in the uh, interest of saving time, I'm not going to read all of these out, 
but these are the eight math practices and they carry through from grades kindergarten through 12th grade and this is the focus and this is the area where we are moving whereas again the content is secondary to that on the science end of things these are the eight what we call science and engineering practices and it's the same thing the content is now taking a back seat to the practices uh, this is really exciting because this is where experiential learning comes in. And we've talked for years about um, enriching our students in uh, ability to uh, think critically. And this is how you get students to think critically. Starting from kindergarten on up, you have to give them those skills and practices. Whereas currently, we are over-focused, I would say, on the content, less of the practices. Not the fault of the Wappinger Central School District. That's just been the standards paradigm we are in. And we are breaking away from that, which is fantastic. And a lot of exciting things that are taking place because of that. So that brings up the question of where are we in this implementation? Um, we've been doing a great job. Admittedly, COVID has gotten in the way, uh, which is why the state has postponed the, impl the official implementation of the new assessments. But where we are at is, uh, I'll, I'll focus on math K through six. Um, under the direction of Jessica Turner, uh, the new standards have been implemented into the scope and sequence documents. Uh, so they're in, the teachers are aware of them, they are in the curricula. And uh, our next step is hopefully this summer, we hope to convene a group of people to actually take those new standards in the scope and sequences and put them in what we call the appropriate clusters. Um, on the science front in K through six, uh, we're working with Putnam Northwest Chester BOCES and their Science 21 kit resource, which has been rolled out K through five. For sixth grade, which uh, in the eyes of the standards are lumped with the seven through eight grade bands, um, they use a Smithsonian kit-based resource. We purchased that, um, I believe the year before last or last year, I might be hazy on that. I have to apologize, it's with COVID, everything is kind of a blur the past two years. Um, so on the K through six and uh, these resources are in, we're working with them. On the seven through 12 end, it's a slightly different paradigm. Um, on the math end, and, and Donna Cart will talk more about that in a second, there's very, very few content changes. So we're focusing on the practices and on the science end, similar kind of deal. We're focusing on the practices and implementing those practices into daily instruction. Um, we've done a lot of professional development surrounding that philosophy. Um, we've done, uh, for the past two years, we didn't run it this year, but uh, John Salmon and I have, have been running a 10 session seminar course on the next gen science, or the, excuse me, the New York State Science Learning Standards and how to incorporate those practices in daily instruction. Uh, John Salmon and Tara Kohler have done a tremendous amount of work this year on project-based learning which again speaks to that experiential piece, bringing the practices in math and science at the forefront of our instruction. And in addition to that, uh, we hope to be resuming our curriculum projects for this summer now that the bulk of COVID is behind us. Um, with that said, I wanna introduce my speakers now who are gonna give you a more first party account of what this looks like in their classes and you know what, what they've been going through as we've been transitioning to these standards. So today with us, I have Ms. Donna Cart, TC of Mathematics for Van Wyck Junior High School. I have John Salmon and Tara Kohler, our, well, not intended here, but esteemed, esteemed professional development specialist. Um, I have Michael Glancy, our TC of Science for Wapenews Junior High School. Ms. Patricia Glancy, our biology instructor at Roy C. Ketchum High School. Charles Ropes, a physics instructor at Roy C. Ketchum High School. Mr. Ian Freeman, physics instructor at John Jay High School. And we have Ms. Kerry Roger here, math instructor at John Jay High School. So with that, I'm going to uh, mute myself, stop presenting, and uh, Donna, you're up first. So uh, tell us uh, how things have been going at the middle school level. Well, it's it's been a, quite an interesting experience and we've all learned new skills, new talents, and automatically being thrown into the world of digital learning. But you know, some of this is gonna carry over and it really has made it a different world than a regular old paper and pencil test anymore. And what we've seen is many of the kids have risen to the occasion to the, the fact of using Google Slides and they're telling us how to put something on there that we can't figure it out. It's been an amazing experience. You know, again, there's some children who this is not the world for them at all. And 
I really am praying we are back in a no more normal for the, those students who have not been successful. And it runs a gamut of reasons. But we've been doing our best. And again, what we really did focus on, given that the way we started the year with the limited time frame, is just making sure we built up our foundations. And luckily, the eighth grade math teachers, we knew what the algebra teachers needed. So we focused on it. And again, with the no finals probably this year, we have some time. So we're going to build on additional foundations that the high school teachers like, because we know they liked when we did polynomial basics. And um, we're actually going to do some inequality stuff. So we're going to get them ready for the high school because we're going to have the time. Um, but it's been going well. And then the seventh grade teachers worked with us to say, what is our foundation? What do we really need? And we're, we're happy to report, given the additional time that we have our students now, we're, we're where we want to be so that we feel that those who have been able to cope under COVID restrictions will hopefully have a, enough of a foundation for that one. With the standards at the, the seventh and eighth grade level, I'll let Carrie talk about the high school level, but at the seventh and eighth grade level, for us, it was more of a cleaning up, a shifting around, and a rewording. And a lot of what we've been doing, what is already added to it, you know, if, if a few standards got removed or shifted a little bit. But in general, again, are they in our forefronts? Not as much because with COVID, we were trying to make sure we just did the best we could. But, you know, we're looking at standards. We were like, okay, we know this standard's now moved. And we reminded the person where it goes and who should be making sure we took care of it. But in general, we're, we're making do. And again, I think that's the, probably the theme from everyone who has been working through this. And in general, like I said, we're, you know, I'm, we're looking forward to doing, hopefully that's wonderful to hear about summer curriculum, because I really feel we need to get our heads back around, making sure that we're doing well. We found some wonderful resources in the textbook series that we're using, and we know our contract's starting to run out with them. So we did request that we keep the online resources, because that became a strong, for many students, that became a very good you know, access point for when they couldn't get to their teachers right away. So, I mean, that's about it for seventh and eighth grade level. Anybody have any questions? Just like my students. <laughs> Thank you very much for that update, Donna. And, and you will be pleased to know that we, we've already quoted out um, the extension for that online resource. We do intend to purchase it. And then uh, beyond next year, we will uh, revisit uh, actually K through 12, the math resources we are using and, and make the appropriate next steps. Uh, next up, we have John Salmon and Tara Kohler uh, to talk about uh, some of the professional development opportunities they have been offering throughout this pandemic. Hey everyone, John, do you want me to present? Sure. Hey everyone, thanks for having us. <laughs> Hang on a second. Sort of what we do. It's a standing mm -hmm. joke. Tara loves to present your screen just in case. For those of us who are not okay, familiar, yeah. this is like Tara's need that. throughout all of COVID has been present my screen, present my screen. So uh, so it's a standing joke with all the PD staff that we're like, of course, Tara, please present your screen for us. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be diving into project-based project learning in the STEAM classroom. So we're just going to quickly brief you on some of the components, or we like to call them um, the design elements of project-based learning. John, do you want to start or you want me to start? Sure. So when Adam talks about the practices, right, the practices are relevant in both math and science. And so when we look at the design elements that fall into project-based learning, it just really works out well because it's not so much content, it's the delivery of the experience for the student and then how we can infuse those practices in. So we'll start off on the left side of the tree where we look at voice and choice and feedback loops and formative assessments. So voice and choice in short is just where we're allowing students opportunities to have a say in what they're learning and how they're learning. Feedback loops, it's really important when we're working through projects that are authentic, which we'll talk about a little bit moving on. Um, how we critique, we reflect and we refine on what we're doing in our work and how we're aligned to the real world. And then the formative and summative assessments, uh, you know, that speaks for themselves. The formative is the ongoing assessment piece. That's the day by day. And then the summative is more of that authentic project that would land out in the real world for people. Um, a project, uh, in project-based learning, you're always starting with a challenging problem and question, which leads students into their sustained inquiry. So throughout uh, the process of PBL, students are constantly revisiting their need to know questions to be able to get to what ends up being that end public product. 
Um, integration is one of our favorite parts. That's where we get to work and integrate our ELA skills. We've done a really nice job this year preserving um, the Teachers College um, Readers and Writers Workshop and integrating it into some of our scheme PBL. Um, and it's just integrating all of the content areas um, that are relevant for the project at the time. And John had mentioned the authenticity piece, um, which just ties into making the project connected to the real world experience. So then we look at the application of learning in the public product. So the public product, I'll jump to that one because that connects to the authenticity. When we're looking at project-based learning, it's not just a project at the end of something. The project is the actual learning and we're trying to connect with community members outside to sit back and say, here's where this is applicable in the real world. So that's what we mean by public product and having an actual authentic audience. And then the application then, of learning, go ahead, Tara. Oh no, I was good, I, sorry, I, you want me to go? Sure. <laughs> so the application of learning is, you know, when we think about um, the different learning models that we have in the classroom, in science, we teach the 5E model. In readers and writers workshop, we're following a mini lesson, small groups, um, conferencing, um, same thing with math. We're doing our um, workshop model with our mini lessons and our small groups and our conferencing. And really, this isn't to replace that. This is an application of all the learning that's taking place during that time into um, our STEAM units. So the application of learning, we'll go back to what Adam had said, we're really focusing heavily on both math and science on the practices in particular. So, this you is want me to jump in on this one? Yeah, you jump, yeah, you jump in on the left, I'll go on the right. Okay, so we have um, STEAM in the classroom, and what we did is we're just highlighting some of the work that's actually happening in the district through this school year. Um, so we have a fourth grade one. So when we're looking at the next gen standards, they're embedded in our scope and sequence. There's some um, brushing up that has to be done on them, but we've been working through those um, thanks to Jessica as she has been compiling those things. So the fourth grade, um, we were looking at hybrid learning. Fourth grade division is particularly challenging for students. And so what we did was the teacher wanted to try and look at something that would be more engaging. So we had students work on creating math blogs in relationship to long division because it's a fairly sophisticated concept for fourth graders. So we said life is too short for long division is the actual project that we were working on. And so students um, went through, worked through their traditional learning modules, um, went through the practices, but then brought in social and emotional pieces because we were all in hybrid at the time. So learning a complicated task while they're at home or they're in school. Um, students created blogs where they were connecting in and talking about their feelings in relationship to it. They created different models on how we learn it best and how they were learning it best. They were explaining it through um, basically a web page is ultimately where all of their work was curated and a blog was created about it. So we had, um, it was one teacher we worked with, but she was departmentalized. So it was the entire fourth grade that ultimately did this within that building. And so life is too short for long division was one of the um, math project-based learning pieces that we had worked on at the elementary level. And we could share this presentation with you at the end. There's not enough time to really go into the projects, but anything that's underlined is hyperlinked out so that you can see some examples of the projects. So um, we're currently running an in-service called PBL 098. It's actually the second time we're running it. We launched the school year with our elementary teachers, um, giving them a brief introduction into PBL. From there, we offered PBL 098 just to our elementary teacher population. And then this um, most recent superintendent's conference day, we ended up doing authentic learning and assessment with our secondary teachers. And to support them beyond the day of soup conference day, we now have a mixture of elementary and secondary teachers in our second cohort of PDL 098. What we really wanna showcase here is that we have two math high school teachers. One is an algebra teacher and one is a geometry teacher who they're right now in the front end early planning stages of projects that they plan to implement, implement next school year. So our algebra teacher is planning to have her students create a comic book um, or an alternative media option to teach the skill of solving equations to students who just don't have that skill yet. And our geometry teacher is working on a PBL um, that answers the question, how can we as city planners design a carless city? Um, so it's, again, taking all of that learning that they need to teach for their regions 
Um, we have these conversations with them. Yes, you are. You have to have your kids get to that end, you know, summative assessment. But how do we take the learning and the application beyond that? Um, so that is what is happening in math. Okay, John, do you want to? You want me to dive into this one, or sure. you want to go? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. So um, this is probably one of our favorite things happening this year is um, working with grade four students in collaboration with Ketchum's manufacturing class um, in our unit energy, speed and motion. And students were proposed with the problem of how can we design a catapult to maximize speed and distance of a projectile. So still preserving the learning experience, taking them through a 5E learning model um, in two different inquiries, students then had to apply their skills of energy, speed and motion to go through the design thinking process of, of um, prototyping a catapult. We then collaborated with Lucas Bliss and his students um, went through their own prototyping process to come up with a hybrid design. Um, and they actually really did make them and delivered them to our fourth graders. Our fourth graders then tested the design for um, energy, speed, and motion. Um, and it was a very exciting experience. So you'll actually see this showcase in our virtual curriculum showcase in a couple of weeks. So what's nice is that this is the second year that we've collaborated with Lucas over at the high school on PBL projects. Last year, his tech students manufactured a multi-sensory playground that second graders designed as part of their properties of matter unit that they were working on. So it's really great when we get to connect with the high school students and the teachers and bring this whole thing together. Um, so I'll move forward with grade five, energy matter and ecosystems is a unit that we've been working on. So we don't currently have a fifth grade next gen aligned resource. So this is something that's in-house created. Um, Flip actually, who's with us today, his work will actually be at the curriculum showcase, but how can we turn a landscape into a native habitat that supports biodiversity? And so what fifth graders were doing was that there is an authentic company down in Westchester that takes plots of your green space in your yard and rewilds it for lack of a better word. And so what they have to do is they're designing a rewild garden that's natural to the environment that they're in. So they have to understand native species of, you know, birds and plants and all kinds of different things. And then they have to understand food web design and that how is this thing going to naturally sustain itself? And so students worked through that and created their, um, their landscapes into native habitats. You want me to keep going into the next one, grade two? Yep. Yeah, okay. go ahead. And then grade two, we have a second grade teacher um, who is working on this. I can't just say a teacher, there's a couple of them. How can we create a news report about the, and um, for the public about earth systems? So they're working on landforms and specific disasters that can happen with, with, um, with situations. And so we wanted to put students into an authentic role that they are actually news reporters and they have to control the erosion and they're talking about flooding in an area. And so they're going out and giving a news report to people but they have to understand landforms. They have to understand erosion and, and other factors that change the landscapes. And so they're working through earth systems and that. And so that's a second grade project-based piece that um, that will be showcased as well at our curriculum showcase. So these are just kind of snapshots. There's mm -hmm. probably a dozen more that are going on throughout the district that are incredible, but we just figured we'd kind of give you a good representation of these here. All right, excellent. I think that was the last slide. So we are all done. Thank any, you for do that. Do we want questions Jeez. now or at the end, Adam? Um, if anyone has any questions now, we, we can address them. I, I try to keep these informal so we can roll questions in. So if anyone has any questions, please, by all means. Sure. We'll put the presentation link in the chat for you. Sure. So Linda has a question. Linda, you're on mute. <laughs> Uh, what's 5E? So the 5E is a, uh, it's a learning cycle in science. It's, um, it's set to have specific things happen at specific times. So it's engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. And so there's particular teacher and student behaviors at each of those E's as you would work through the learning cycle. Any other questions? Okay, so I, I definitely want to thank John and Tara for the work that they're doing. Uh, I think you can see that what they're doing is transformative. 
And um, it, it does encompass the whole of our K through 12 spectrum in both math and science. So we look forward to the continuation of the work that they are doing. And I, I would tell you they are extraordinarily valuable to our programs. Um, so next up, we have Mike Glancy, who's going to talk about science at the junior high schools. All right. Hey, guys, how are you? Uh, let me just present so I have some talking points to, to show you and keep me focused. Um, I'm kind of a master at this. I've been doing this uh, the whole school year, so hopefully, hopefully it works okay. Um, so uh, with collaborating with my other science teachers, um, here's one of the things that we came up with for our approach so far. We're kind of bridging the gap between the old standards, which Adam had stated started back in 1996, uh, so to still be able to cover those, but also address and, and push into uh, some of the new standards. And one of the easiest ways that we found to approach this was to switch the order of doing things. Um, to, instead of starting off with, with notes and, and talking points and presentations and having the kids hear everything first and then do an experiment to rediscover that, um, we allowed the students to kind of find the what. Um, lab activities, normally are handed uh, hands-on um, are, are then supplemented by more information as needed. So the kids do a little activity, they get some experience, they make some observations, and as they dig a little bit deeper into the topic, more information is provided so that they finally gain the same information that they normally would at the end. Um, and one of the ways that I like to, to approach it is with a, a claim, evidence, and a reasoning approach, where the claim allows them to observe a process or observe a phenomena. Could be they actually do an experiment, or it could be a picture or a graph that they're made, uh, they're allowed to observe. Um, and then from that experience, they make a claim, which is kind of like an overarching statement based on what they see. Um, they collect and organize data that serves as the evidence to support this claim. And then everything is summarized to, to, to develop a, an overall understanding of a event or approach or a topic in science. So that's kind of how we've approached it at, at Wappingers Junior High. Um, some of the approaches to science and just in general this year, because we've been working all remotely and I've, I've been remote the whole time, is you can still do the same things, just with through a different lens. And so um, Explore Learnings, they have a program called Gizmos, which is a great way to kind of simulate um, some pretty complex uh, processes. It allows them to manipulate variables uh, to try and truly understand what's what's happening. Um, uh, FET Animations is out of uh, the University of Colorado that allows you to do something very similar. Um, so you can kind of guide, have some guided uh, inquiry with, with that, um, allowing kids to, to uh, generate the claims and evidence uh, and overall reasoning. Um, we can do a lot of digital labs have been done this year throughout the department. Um, even if it's something as simple as analysis of images and graphs. Um, Jamboard has a great platform for these kind of labs, especially early on in the year when most people were remote. Um, and it was a, kind of like a, a digital version of a lab. And so the kids would actually work through a lab and, and as they make observations, they would drop sticky notes um, to write down what they see, to explain the evidence for it. Um, and then eventually we together come up with the reasonings. Um, and then we've also worked through projects to explore the topics. So one example was a solar system and moon phases project, which incorporated a choice board uh, for the students. And then some of the researches that we found most helpful this year were definitely all the G Suite programs. Um, and we really learned how to, how to be fluent with them and then actually learn the advantages. Um, and I'm actually looking forward to potentially having a one-to-one -one, uh, classroom with um, Chromebooks next year to kind of continue the progress. Uh, it's a great way of allowing students to be organized, but then also to have the resources of, of um, Google, Google Slides and the Jamboard um, to really enhance learning. Uh, Google Classroom has been a great way to kind of level the playing field in a lot of ways and allowing students to have access to the same material regardless of their setting, whether they're home or in school. 
Um, Google Slides has been my go-to for a lot of activities uh, since it allows you to manipulate things. You can change images, label images, uh, label graphics, uh, been able to graph. I've had students build their own weather maps uh, based on analyzing data. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a really useful program, far more than just the presentation piece. Um, and then a lot of my teachers have found Cami is a great way to annotate PDF. And um, one, one teacher uses Wiser Me, which is like an interactive worksheet platform that allows you to embed videos um, and images on top of a traditional practice type worksheet. So that's where we are standing right now. Um, what questions do you have? Mike, I don't think I have a question. I think it's nice from the elementary level to see some of the things that you're talking about and know that we're employing them in the elementary classrooms as well with CER, where we go through that systematically. How are we, I mean, we live out of FET simulations as well. And so it's nice to see that we have this commonality as we're working because it, 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 it ensures that we can be more coherent. I think such a big district, we can be disconnected sometimes. And so it's nice to see that. Yeah, and I feel the same way. It's, it's wonderful to hear um, what the students are actually experiencing in the elementary setting. So we can build on that and, and say, hey, you did learn this when you were in fifth grade, or you, you should you should know how to try this approach. So it's it's nice. It's encouraging. Um, it would be they would be telling you lies, Mike, if they said they didn't. <laughs> Mike, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what are uh, some of the um, activities, lessons, uh, programs, uh, best practices that you're looking forward to continuing next year when we're in person that you experienced, developed uh, this year during a virtual and remote learning environments? I've done a lot. So, um, so um, mapping, mapping in the beginning of the year is usually a traditional paper and pencil process where you, you have the kids uh, generate an isoline map um, for depicting changes in the variables in the, in the atmosphere. Um, so having them able to use it on Google Slides allows them to easily add color, um, easily manipulate the changes so they can really kind of see it. Uh, and then you can quickly embed video clips or images into the, into the same slideshow to kind of really enhance it. Um, I also really I like I like the um, I like the Jamboard uh, program. Uh, it allows you to uh, do my uh, Ignis Rock lesson. It allows you to you know ha instead of having the uh, you can put up a, a picture of like a, a rock like granite and have the kids real quickly kind of generate um, what they see. And it allows the other kids in the room to very quickly and anonymously um, post their observations without being criticized by their fellow students, which is it was really big in the, in, a, in a middle school setting where the kids are afraid to raise their hand for, for um, risk of um, risk of saying something in, inaccurate. Um, so that's 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 a real helpful process to use. Um, and I really enjoy just the organization piece of the of the Google Classroom. Um, and, I, and I can envision myself rather than you know passing out and collecting papers that have a lot of things in the Google Classroom even next year, where the, I'm able to kind of, uh, as the kids are working on something in lab groups or individually, I can I can kind of scroll through what they're working on and, and give them real time feedback on, on how to improve or, or what they're doing um, well. So I hope that answered your question detailed enough. No, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, if there's no more questions, um, we'll go to uh, Patty Glancy uh, from Roy C. Ketchum. But I will add, um, in terms of the conversation of allowing more time for elementary and secondary teachers to interface, John Tara and I were working on a um, an inner school visitation program that unfortunately kind of had to be put to the side in the past COVID. We very, very much look forward to getting back to that work because uh, you know we all unanimously agree that it's crucial to really bridge the chasm between elementary and secondary. And you'll see that in the new standards for math and science, and I believe ELA as well, 
Um, that's kind of the theme of it. We're looking at a, a total K through 12 spectrum, not an elementary camp versus a secondary camp. So that is also something we will be looking forward to. Um, all right, Patty, you're up. Thank you. Yep, I put up my presentation so it made sure to load. So the unique structure of this pandemic school year definitely expedited my transition to next generation science standards um, with the shortened classes. I found that I was almost exclusively delivering all of my content through activities and labs. Um, I mostly teach through using case studies, which I get from the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science. And some of my students' favorites this year have been Barbara's thyroid for the endocrine system, diabetes and insulin signaling, stalking the genetic basis of a trait with corn, and the lionfish invasion. And I've been increasingly using storylines and anchoring phenomenal images. I get most of them from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Biointeractive. And storylines allow students to explain an overarching phenomenon and they're guided by student-generated questions. So some of the students' favorites this year have been evolution of lactose intolerance, mystery of the missing tusks, cancer cell invasion, and then the lone anole, which is the anole lizard. And I've never done that one before. Um, it's something that I've always seen, but I have a student this year who's new to our district from Jamaica. He moved here during the pandemic. And one act, other activity he was doing, he said, hey, you know, that's kind of like, isn't it kind of like there's this lizard with this flap under its neck and they're all over my island. And I said, you know what? I said, you are right. It is kind of like that. And that motivated me to um, figure out this activity and we moved to doing that. So he liked it. He didn't like that we had to watch a lot of videos and see a lot of images on lizards because he doesn't really like them, but it was a great activity. So I also do phenomenon driven lab design. Um, some of the ones that I'm looking forward to still doing is one on a BBC article on refugee children in Sweden who sleep for literally months at a time, sloth metabolism, and we currently have a live ant habitat that's generating quite a lot of questions and hypotheses. I also use the QFT question formulation technique. One of the students' favorites was back in the fall with a Wappinger's Falls man who grew over a thousand pound pumpkin from a tiny little seed and I brought in the seeds and they generated quite a lot of questions some science related some non-science related questions all related to that phenomenon I also found this year I subscribed to data nuggets datanuggets.org which is designed to bring contemporary research and authentic data into the classroom the students favorite or not so favorite because it was about birds that die over a billion birds die each year from crashing into windows. And it was about real science, a real scientist's actual data that compared birds in urban areas to migrant birds in urban areas to just birds that normally live in the urban areas. And then an absolute favorite in our whole department is the use of POGOLs, which are process-oriented guided inquiry learning. And some of my students' favorite this year's was biological classification photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And using all of these this year has definitely increased both my student engagement and my own engagement during this pandemic remote and hybrid learning. So that's all I have if anybody has any questions. Is it just data nuggets, Patty? Datanuggets.org, data okay. yep. And so it's- um, Fieldscapes that we like it too, but I wanna check that one out. So I'm gonna Google that, thank you. Yeah, no, it's great. It's organized by level. So there's different levels. I might use a different one for my AP students versus my region students. And there's different graphs. So you can really get into it. Thank you, Patty. Um, by now, you, a couple of times you've heard the term phenomenon thrown around with regards to science instruction. This is a um, a trademark of the next gen science standards. Um, as I said, practice is at the forefront, content's behind it. In the old way, we would basically give all the students the content and then give them some room to work with it. Here, it's the opposite. You're, the idea is to present them with a phenomenon, something they can look at. Uh, and instead of telling them about it and teaching them about it, the idea is to get them to explore it first, to ask questions, to, again, uh, 
these are the practices to do things like ask questions, to develop models, to explain what they see. And then as they kind of try to unpack the phenomenon that we give them, uh, the teacher's role then uh, kind of switches to slowly dispensing information to them so they can revise their models and revise their thinkings and get them to the end of that process. So that's why you're seeing that term phenomenon. And um, you, would st you will start seeing now phenomenon-based instruction becoming kind of ubiquitous through our entire K through 12 spectrum. Uh, so with that said, next up we have Charlie Ropes, physics instructor at Ketchum High School. Take it away. Hi, everyone. I, I, I'm going to focus really on a, a lab that, that, I, that, I, um, that I did earlier this year with my students. Uh, but before I even you know, talk about this, you know, I'm hearing Mike talk about you know, FET simulations, use of Jamboard. Uh, and I think all of us as science and math teachers, it doesn't really matter what subject you're in. Uh, obviously, we're rethinking how we're teaching uh, because of the pandemic and, uh, and the remote aspect of our, of, uh, of our teaching. So in any event, uh, one, of the, one of the labs I did and uh, that my kids actually liked quite a bit was, was one that I did with what's called the simple pendulum. And uh, and I parenthetically put it here as another way to find G. And for science teachers, we know that that little G stands for acceleration due to gravity. And in the very beginning of the year, when they were learning about kinematics, they actually did a calculation on G in an at-home lab where they basically dropped objects and used their kinematics equations to find the acceleration due to gravity, which, by the way, is about 9.8 meters per second squared. In metric terms, it's about 32.2 feet per second squared in English terms. Anyway, I start off this lab with basically questioning them on what do they think is going to affect the period of oscillation of a pendulum? Is it going to be angular displacement? Is it going to be the mass? Or is it going to be the length of that pendulum? And so I basically pose that question to them. And this is basically what the lab setup looked like. Uh, and it was just a simple water bottle. And what's so great about this is that uh, using a couple eye hooks and some string, things you can find around the house, plus a throwaway 500 milliliter water bottle, uh, we can actually investigate all those factors quite readily and easily. And in any event, those pre-lab questions are, and this is what I find is very interesting, is to have the kids actually make their, um, assessment or their their um guess in terms of what how that period of oscillation is affected by changes in mass how much water is in that water bottle the length of that string and then the angle of displacement how far from the from the vertical position do you do you do you change that angle and how much does that actually affect that period of oscillation and so the kids will have their their various opinions then obviously what we do is i have them go and collect their data where they hold the other two variables associated with this lab, constant, as we like to call it, a controlled experiment. Then what they do is they visualize the data. And I'm just using some data that I collected, but nevertheless, this is actually, you know, kids who actually collected very good data have data that looks almost exactly like mine. So initially when they collect their data, they're told to plot the period versus length, they find that it's not linear. And one of the key aspects of this is the make meaning of their data. So they were told to linearize their data. In other words, if you plot the period squared versus the length, you'd find that it creates a nice linear relationship. At this point here, because the kids don't know, we gave them or told them to look up what the equation is for the period of a pendulum. And then what they had to do is they had to use, hopefully their mathematical background and a little bit of algebraic rearrangement to actually figure out what the slope of that line represented. And if they did it correctly, they would have found that the slope of that line actually has the acceleration due to gravity embedded in it. And so from that, they could actually calculate the acceleration due to gravity. Um, and in matter of fact, I can say that this particular data gave us a value that was less than 1% off. In fact, it was less than half a percent off. Now, I will say that I put this slide together before I saw Adam's presentation, where he talked about the eight science and engineering practices. And I got thinking to myself, well, how do those practices actually apply to this particular lab? And, and this is just one example of the type of lab that we're, that 
that I think that we're doing in this um, era of being at home, where Wednesdays, by and large, are my lab days at home because everyone's at home and I can expect everyone to do the lab at home. Uh, nevertheless, we have to find materials that they have at home because we don't have the lab materials in the classroom that we can send home with them. And that's one of the uh, one of the difficulties, but also I, I would say in this particular case was um, was a really nice outcome in my in my opinion of how we can take use of things around the house and actually make an experiment with it. Nevertheless, we've got the those eight science and engineering practices and in one way or the other to one extent or the other, I feel like we can tie this lab in to each and every one of those eight practices. Um, and if you want to look further into those engineering practices, the uh, science and engineering practice of the NGSS standards, um, the these two bullets, I will say, more or less fit within the realm of the simple pendulum. There is an energy associated with it, even though it's not really discussed in this particular lab, it is discussed in the curriculum itself. And what I've done here in my last slide here, and I will put this link in the chat, is I got a link to both the lab document as well as an instructional video that actually kind of tells the kids, gives them an idea, this is how you can go about doing this lab. And you know, I will say that A, the kids found uh, value from a learning perspective out of it. It was a challenge to them in that uh, it wasn't just a matter of being fed data and then asked to analyze the data and to actually collect the data. They actually had to have some sort of experiential learning, which I think is important, whether you're at home or in the school. And I hope I did that in less than my allotted time of five minutes. Um, I'm going to find this. I'm going to stop presenting. And I hope I didn't take anything from, from uh, Ian there, because I know Ian is going to be talking as a physics teacher. He's probably going to be talking about some of the other lab things we've done as well. Any questions for me? OK, thank you, Charlie. Um, much appreciated. Um, you know, it, it's again, this is really showing how we are stressing the practices in our instructional model more so than the content. Uh, all right, Ian, you're up. I ask if you please just try to <laughs> get through this as, as quickly as possible. There, there's still a, a bit we have to cover, and I want to be respective of everyone's time. I realize how late this is running, and I do sincerely apologize. Um, okay. Well, the good news is that these awesome presentations so far have actually covered some of the things that I was going to mention already. Uh, it's been fantastic. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the pedagogical things that we have done at John Jay in the science department. Um, and I surveyed many of the teachers there, and I've actually posted a link to this also if anyone wants to bring it up um, later on. Uh, and you'll see a lot of the same things people have mentioned, gizmos, at-home lab activities, phenomenon-based learning, flip grids, uh, some stuff that's new, gamification, like escape rooms, jam boards, near pods, all this stuff, breakout room activities, pogles. Um, we've also seen a really nice increase in collaboration with teachers from across the district and across the state with other schools as well. And I think that has been one of the real positives to come out of um, this difficult, challenging time is an increase in collaboration. I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of these pedagogical techniques fit into these three dimensions of New York Next Gen Science Standards, uh, the practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts. So let's start with phenomenon-based learning. And the idea is that students are going to observe something to start with. And this could be a live demonstration by the teacher, could be videos or ed puzzle videos. It could be an in-person lab, or it could be an at-home lab like uh, Mr. Ropes just discussed. Um, we could do virtual online lab simulations like gizmos and FETs, or you could simulate pre-collected lab data with things like Pogles and Google Slides. Uh, the next step would be then to have students interact and draw conclusions and develop models based on this. Uh, and so they are developing some of these core ideas themselves 
through science and engineering practices. And they're gonna be sharing their conclusions and working with each other. And they can do this individually, um, maybe with Google Slides and Docs, we've used a lot of the G Suite products, um, but they might do it together as a class led by the teacher. And this could be with like a shared Google Doc or Jamboards or Pear Deck, where they're interacting with a document that everyone is using, or it could be small group analysis working with breakout rooms um, and like a shared Google Doc or Slides or Jamboards or whatever um, these groups want to use. And then the third aspect is cross-cutting concepts. How can they connect their findings to science, engineering, other aspects of the world around them? So it could be through a lot of different opportunities, follow-up questions and activities, peer discussions, engineering challenges, and projects. So, so many of the things that we have seen so far work into these three dimensions of the new New York st standards of science. Um, another example, and I took Tara and John's class on project-based learning. Um, so one of the projects that I developed through their, uh, through their class that I took for a superintendent's conference day was I broke my physics students into separate teams and had them create their own professional research labs. And they named their lab, they established roles and developed pro promotional materials. So you can see you have different roles here, principal investigator, communications coordinator, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they had a number of tasks they needed to do. So developing experiments and reports on static electricity as a part of this professional science lab. They had to replicate a published circuit experiment and look for errors and improvements. They had to design electrical components for NASA and write a bid proposal to produce this electrical component for NASA. Um, they had to analyze the lab's electrical costs, so their own electrical use, um, looking at uh, also solar panels and then writing a proposal to install solar panels uh, as a part of their own research lab. And they have a community outreach uh, component where they're making videos to teach younger kids about magnetism. And then each student has an independent research project also that they can do a, as a part of their group or not. And if you think about it, these hit all of the different core uh, dimensions in the New York science standards. Um, so, and, and I'll tell you, there was all this other stuff that I got from other teachers. I'm not gonna go over in detail. I mean, Mrs. Miller sent me stuff where she has students drawing pixel art through looking at different kinds of bonds in chemistry and using Google drawings as a part of her class. Uh, Mr. Croco sent me some awesome things looking at like uh, comparative anatomy and evolution uh, with students doing feedback through Nearpod. Um, we had some awesome escape rooms we ran this year with a murder mystery, uh, and I did a Halloween a physics zombie escape room. So there's so much great stuff that we have developed this year that fits into the science standards. And for me and for us, I think the big question is like, what's next? We spent a lot of time developing these activities, so how can we continue to use and adapt them for the future? Um, and I'll tell you, like, personally, I know, uh, I think uh, Michael Galancy had mentioned how it would be wonderful to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, classrooms with Chromebooks. And I have to agree, like if that's a possibility, it would be fantastic because it's an opportunity to continue to use these in the future. Um, so I know we're running late and I'm going to stop there. And if there's any questions, please go for it. Ian, I, got, I have one question. Your, that project you did, was that with your honors or your AP kids? I assume your honors. That was with my honors kids, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, uh, you, you'll be pleased to know, and I, and I have to give a shout out here to Art Shouten, who is made a monumental leap towards getting us close to being one to one. Um, I, I think we started this year thinking that that was a really lofty goal, and now it's it's we're inching closer to that as a reality. And it's you know all thanks to him and the work of his department and getting those Chromebooks out into the community and. Uh, every day I, I see him setting up Chromebooks. There's piles and piles and piles of them. So we, uh, you guys would be happy to know that we're, we're getting there. Uh, hopefully we will be there soon. Um, with that said, um, I do want to get to Kerry Roger to talk about math, but that really wraps up everything we're all about with this transition to the science standards. Um, as you can see, the work is echoing the same message across the entire grade spe uh, spectrum, across all of our different schools. And I would be willing to wager that our teachers are better versed in uh, the new science standards than 
in any district where I've had the chance to work with, with teachers in those districts. I'm very, very proud of this team and the work that they've continued to do, even in the face of um, this amazingly crazy times with the pandemic. So please give yourselves a hand. Uh, with that said, Carrie, please give us an update on where we are going with uh, high school math instruction. Hi, I'm Carrie Roger. I work at John Jay. I um, this year teach algebra one B and geometry plus. I have been with the geometry plus class for the last three years, and it has changed at John Jay, which has been pleasant for me. Um, the plus class is just a has an extra lab attached to it so students take my regular geometry class and then every other day they come to a geometry lab um, and it's just been really nice for me um, in past years when i taught geometry i felt like i always lost some students because um, i had to cover so much material so this lab has really been nice for me to um, really get more kids engaged and want to do geometry and like geometry so I do a lot of hands-on um, activities and games, and, and I use lots of different um, manipulatives. I know Adam came in one time when we were working on proofs, which is always a tough subject, and he came and witnessed. I had a whole setup where kids actually had laminated pieces, and they got to move them around. So they didn't feel like they were writing and wasting their time doing it wrong. So they could kind of play with what goes with what. And then I would walk around and see the groups and actually hear them discussing proofs and steps and, and the series of how things should work. So it just gives me a little extra time to go a little bit deeper with students who maybe struggle with math. Um, I know this year has been a, um, tough with you know, the hybrid version. I can't always do the same thing, but this year um, I was able to use some of the same games and it's been kind of fun. And I've had it as kids at home versus kids at school. And there've been some conversations going back and forth and they really got into it. But for me, I think the Geometry Plus, that extra lab just gets me to connect with my students better. They tend to want to come. I can hear them, you know, behind me saying, oh, I have lab today. And they're actually excited to come and stay with me. Um, it just, you know, if kids get stuck on certain topics, it gives other kids an opportunity. I do a lot of group work where they then teach um, the other student. Or sometimes I make different groups where a kid is a, um, master at one question and so the other kids get to work on it and when they have questions they don't come to me they go to that other student and that student teaches them and goes th through the um, process of how to solve something so i think it just helps boost their confidence um, it helps them have a better understanding um, with wednesdays i've been trying to do more fun activities where you know i'll say like show me an amazon box you know and then kids are like that's the only time they turn on their cameras to show me their box you know and and so we do surface area and volume and i say find a ruler and i just get to do more um activities i don't necessarily have time in the regular class period and i've just noticed um they've really been getting into it um you know just recently we've had a lot of fires on our side of the district which has been upsetting and one girl says oh i miss this assignment and a girl from home was like hey can i tell her how to do it and i said sure i'll write on the board and I don't know if that student would have spoken up as quickly if it was the beginning of the year or even if it was last year. But I think it, she has felt so confident as the year is going on that she is secure in knowing the material that she feels like she can help others. And so that's really what comes down to it. I'm seeing kids performing better, wanting to do better because they're seeing that success. And they're asking to go on to algebra too and they want to keep going further with math. Um, and if a question comes up um, about painting a room, you know, someone says, oh, I'm repainting my room. Of course, I turn it into a math question. Then they all groan. And but then I get to show them how all right, how much is a can of paint? And a kid, I said, look it up. So a kid will look it up on Lowe's or Home Depot. And it's sometimes a spur of the moment, but it it's all related to math and how what I'm doing in the classroom can relate to um, everyday life. So the lab has just been, it's kind of perked me up with my teaching because it made me want to be a little more creative, be a little more spontaneous, and in some ways let the kids lead. Um, like I said, one girl was all excited to tell me she painted her room and she, she was showing me on the camera and I said, oh, do you know how much that costs your mother? And she goes, what do you mean? You know, so it's just kind of 
a, a fun experience and I think the kids enjoy it. And like I said, when I hear them say, oh, I have math lab today and they actually sound exciting, um, it's kind of a nice thing because usually there's a bad stigma with math. Um, so it's kind of fun and I've gotten great feedback from parents and students over the years as how this course has been going. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and, and I just want to point out that Carrie has been uh, one of the champions of <laughs> our Geometry Plus program. And I wanted to give you an update on that program. Uh, you'll recall that uh, when we gave our previous math presentation at uh, the curriculum committee meeting, this was in the year just prior to COVID, we had discussed uh, where we were going in terms of our math remediation programs. We have the two-year algebra track, the Algebra 1A and 1B. Um, so at that time when we met, we had just implemented our Algebra Plus course. Since then, uh, our programs have grown, and I just wanted to update you on our most recent data. So again, I should be in presentation mode here. Sorry about that. Um, in 2018, which was the first year that we ran the Algebra Plus program, uh, here are the Regents results. So 79% of our students taking Algebra passed the New York State Regents exam. 63% uh, passed who are taking the Algebra 1B. Now keep in mind, the Algebra 1A and 1B track were specifically created uh, to try to bring equity to our struggling math learners. Um, we decided that we wanted to pilot this Algebra Plus program to be a one-year track that actually has an attached lab so the students are eligible to take the Regents exam at the end of their first year. And again, the name of the game is equity and try to bring equity between our math learners and our struggling math learners. Well, at the end of that year in 2018, we achieved equity. 80% of our students uh, who took the Regents from that Algebra Plus course passed. Um, now, looking at that, it's a small sample size. You need another year's worth of data. So taking a look at the following year, 2019, our Algebra pass rate was 92%. Our Algebra 1B pass rate, 64%. Our Algebra Plus pass rate, 88%. 2019 was also the first year that we decided to introduce a Geometry Plus variant for our struggling geometry students. And again, this is to try to promote more students who will remain on track for the Advanced Regents Diploma. Our pass rate in geometry that year across the board for all of our students in the district was 69%. The students taking geometry plus 83%. So you're seeing there the power of that lab that Carrie's talking about and all the opportunities of having that lab brings. I am pleased to report that as of this year, we not only have introduced an ICT Algebra Plus, we are also throwing in an ICT Geometry Plus into the mix for next year. And as of now, our 21-22 enrollment data has 89 students slated for Algebra Plus or ICT Algebra Plus and 140 students slated for Geometry Plus and ICT Geometry Plus. So we are very excited about the results of these programs. Um, we think it's over the next several years, it's going to drastically improve our math scores. And uh, we hope um, with the right level of staffing to even possibly introduce an Algebra 2 plus into the program. So with that said, these are the updates for our math and science curriculum. Uh, I very much appreciate your patience. Uh, there was a lot that we covered. There was a lot that was shared. Um, so I know this uh, took way longer uh, than we were given, but I do appreciate your time um, and um, uh, patience. And of course, if you have any questions, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Adam. We definitely appreciate uh, your work on this and a special thank you to all of the staff that presented what you are doing um, in your classrooms uh, this school year. Uh, we definitely appreciate uh, you spending time evening, as well as what you do every day uh, with the students. Uh, just a reminder to everyone on the committee about uh, the purpose behind having the plus classes and moving away from the two-year algebra class, the algebra 1A and the algebra 1B, and that is to provide students the opportunity to take um, and earn the um, Algebra uh, 1 credit and the Regents uh, in one year, rather than dividing that in, into two years. This way they will have an opportunity to take additional math courses. Um, and so far that has been very successful and, and I definitely thank um, Adam Panzer and the math department for their work on that. 
Are there any questions uh, regarding math and science for Adam or any of the teachers that are on the call? Go on, Peg. Just so that I'm clear, uh, the ad, um, algebra plus and the geometry plus is a lab every other day in addition to the regular class time. And is it with the same teacher they have for the regular class? Yes, th th that is correct. So let, let's say if you have a full section of 30 in Geometry Plus, it's split up. So every other day, 15 of those students stay behind with that same teacher. So it's really uh, a year and a half of math in one. Um, mm -hmm. so students will receive the full credit for Geometry. And then in both Algebra and Geometry, they get a half elective credit for taking the plus class. So what's nice is, is that we're actually even able to give them transcript credit for taking the additional lab. Yeah, and they get the extra time with the in a smaller group with during the lab. Yes, that, so um, at, at most you will never have a lab class uh, breaching 15 students. Mm -hmm. Sounds as though it might be expanded to other subjects. It's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from any uh, committee members for math and science? All right. Well, thank you, um, Adam, and uh, uh, all, all the teachers that are on the line. At this point, you are free to log off, um, and the committee will continue with our agenda items. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and all that you do. Thank so, you, Dr. Cordwell. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. So committee members, we are running over time. We do have Jessica Turner who is prepared to do um, uh, a five to 10, probably a 10 minute presentation on the updates regarding ELA and social studies and, and curriculum responsiveness. You guys have a few extra minutes for her to go or do you want us to schedule another meeting? She said it will only take like 10 minutes. You guys okay with staying on? I do have to get leaving in a few minutes, but I know, the right? needs, you know. I know you already told me you had that thing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So are we good with everybody else? Yes, I have a few minutes. Yep, no problem. All right. So Jessica, go on. Remember everyone, we're still recording. <laughs> okay. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. As you know, in the beginning of the school year, the board uh, set the goal for the ELA and social studies department to become more culturally responsive um, and infuse uh, items into the curriculum that were accurate, local, state, no national history, um, more divergent thinking and more inclusive thinking. Um, so I just have an update. So this year, as we continue through the through the school year, we focused on professional development, right? Not necessarily the curriculum development, but providing teachers with the professional development that they need. So when we go into the summer, we would be prepared to write curriculum and make changes for the next school year. So on March 19th, we had superintendent's conference day. We started with daring classrooms, which is creating safe spaces for adults and students to have conversations around um, difficult topics or challenging topics or even traumatic topics, historical and current. Um, we had a training on how to speak up and respond to biased language, purposeful use involvement to promote equity, uh, tackling tough topics in the classroom. Uh, during the, we also have the Daring Classroom Book Club that's continuing beyond the superintendent's conference day. So it's an eight, um, an eight session book club where teachers and I will be uh, focusing on reading this book, um, Daring to Lead. So again, building safe spaces and taking a look at vulnerability, shame, and how that is in the classroom and how do we create spaces where everyone's voice feels that it is um, heard. And then we've started the curriculum writing involvement in that we have um, a teacher signing up 
to participate in a curriculum audit for equitable learning experiences through DC BOCES. And then we have ELA teachers who will attend the curriculum design during uh, July 13th through 15th. So we then, in addition to professional development, we have already started the curriculum revision process. We just um, haven't finished it. So we have a committee of 22 teachers, six from the high school, five from the middle school. The goal is to, to, to choose two new texts to infuse into the scope and sequence for next year. So right now they're reading books making recommendations to, to each other, uh, presenting what books would be appropriate for middle school, what books would be appropriate for high school, do they meet the skills and standard and strategies that are written into the standards. So not only are we looking for books that are written by BIPOC authors or represent a different perspective culturally, we're looking for books that will also help us meet the standards of next gen in ELA and social studies. Um, we want to build empathy, mirror and windows, broaden perspectives of the world, experience of others. Empathy is huge, right? Um, and then the social studies U.S. history curriculum writing project. We have teachers who will review the curriculum and choose units to add non-traditional perspectives um, to teach during the identified time periods. Possible examples could include the Tulsa Massacre, Seneca Village, which was um, Central Park at one before Central Park existed, Tuskegee Airmen, et cetera. Um, we have contracted PNW BOCES and their experts who, who do this work to come in and work with myself and the teachers and those that will be occurring July 19th that week. And then our current projects that we have going on, we have Every Kid in the Park project. It's a collaboration with FDR Park. Social, it's a social studies US history focused project. Um, and I just linked out to the classroom so you can see the students. There's a fourth grade students, eighth grade students, and 11th grade students involved in this project. They'll assume the role of historians and national park advocates to answer the question, how can they convey a true story of America's national parks and ensure that future generations can connect, protect, and inspire park stewards, right? And so what's great about this project is we're focusing on, you know, different populations who have participated in the creation of our parks and helping our parks uh, steward out their resource to non-traditional visitors. Um, and our students are working with local historians in Dutchess County, the park educators, librarians. So they have uh, resources. It's a real live project and they're actually doing civic work, right? So civics is infused in this cultural responsive project, which will be presented at the curriculum showcase. And then, and that's kind of it. So any questions? Go ahead, Peggy. Okay, uh, just a comment on this, what you said about the national parks. Just today, I heard an online lecture by a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And she discussed how, uh, how they found out with DNA and how it matched their oral family histories and uh, what the Jefferson Foundation has done to include them at Monticello. So it was very interesting. Um, yeah. I was wondering, I also recently reread The Language Police by Diane Ravitch, which of course she wrote a few years ago, but she discusses um, as a historian who worked on reviews for uh, various curriculum studies, uh, she's, um, the difficulty it is uh, with textbooks when they're being uh, reviewed by publishers long before they get to even be chosen by schools, uh, that so many people uh, cancel out things that this bothers them, that bothers them. And she said if it takes all life out of it and becomes uh, sugar-coated in all directions. And she said, you know, both the right and the left are equally guilty of this. And uh, the publishers wanting to sell books give in to everybody, 
So I was wondering if that's still a problem with the textbooks we're using, especially in social studies. Uh, are they so concerned with avoiding controversy that uh, we really have to get away from textbooks and, and use uh, use uh, materials that will challenge the students and present more than one point of view so they can really examine these issues and incidents? Yes, and that's why we have uh, the a PNW VOCES coming to collaborate with us over the summer. You know, with social studies, we have over 40 different courses when you include our elective courses, our AP versions of global, our honors, you know, we have regular global, honors global, AP global, and then that continues for US history. So we have a variety of courses where we have to examine um, our current curriculum and decide what needs to be infused. So our first step, if you remember in the fall, was adopting Newsella as a resource because Newell's, Newsella gives us tons of primary documents, which is important for social studies, and different perspective primary documents, including um, histories of BIPOC um, populations and LGBTQ+, right? So we're not leaving anyone out. We're trying to infuse the voices of all perspectives, all histories, all cultures. It's just that um, we focused on US history for this summer, and then we'll continue um, doing work uh, as the years progress in the different courses, but absolutely taking a look at our resources and the big read that we talked about in, in the beginning is another way that we're looking for books that can be cross-curricular, right? So there's a US history part. There's also the, the different perspective of the Vietnam American experience during that Vietnam War, but it's also an ELA book, right? So how are we doing all of this and making it um, doable when we go back to the, the, um, the board goal? It's not adding on to our curriculum. It's how do we infuse our curriculum and make it so that it's not an additional burden on teachers, right? But that we have this wonderful experience with different thinking for our students, these resources that help our, our teachers meet that goal, but it's not something that we can't achieve in the course of our 180 instructional days, right? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Jessica. Uh, we definitely appreciate uh, the presentation and the information you shared. It's important for the committee to know that this is work that is ongoing. Um, Jessica has been uh, working uh, diligently with her staff, uh, looking at the scope and sequences, looking at the curriculum materials, and will work to create uh, multi-year plans uh, with, with her staff. Um, so in addition to looking at the culturally uh, responsive um, modifications uh, that are needed, she is also looking at the K-12 continuum for ELA and social studies, making sure that uh, we're meeting the academic needs um, of students and also supporting our, our teachers in this work. So uh, thank you very much. At this point, I'm going to uh, stop presenting.